Olympic Dam. We've all heard about this big deposit, but how much do we actually know about it? I'm going to present on, from a mind geology perspective on the complexities, the data compilation, uh, data gathering of, of our daily duties, and actually tackling such a behemoth of an ore body. Just out of interest, sir, any mind geologists in the room? Yeah, a couple? Cool. <laughs> all right. This is a picture of our core farm. We have 25 racks that are constantly full of fresh core. We drill night shift and day shift, and per month produce around, rough, on average, 15,000 meters of core. So how do we deal with this data? Huge amounts of data, not just for logging, data collection, but also <clears throat> turning those data points into a model. Quick disclaimer, if you want the full version, so there's a copy of it under your seat, so you can touch on that later. Just a quick introduction. So before I jump into the model, I think it's pertinent to look at some geology. Um, would love to go into a bit more detail, but due to our time restrictions, this is just going to be a very rough uh, geology 101 on Olympic Dam. So from north to south, the geology strikes, we have about six kilometers. Um, East-west, three kilometers, and an average depth of the, of the ore body around 800 meters. Um, it's hosted within our metaproterozoic rock be down granite and concealed for, with about 350 meters of cover sequence. So you drive over Roxby Downs, you would not uh, uh, believe that you have such an ore body lying beneath you. Um, the, the, the mineralized system is um, controlled by a hydrothermal <coughs> brecciation system, uh, which is host to our um, iron oxide copper gold. And in our, in our case, we have that uranium component as well, which complicates things. Um, in terms of structure, we have two kind of sets of structure. We have our pre, pre to sin um, um, mineralization structure, um, acting as conduits for our fluid and, and mineralization. And we have our pre to post, sorry, sin to post, which essentially uh, um, in charge of the dismemberment of the ore body. Um, the, third, the third point at the bottom there, which is a deposit-wide uh, zonation, um, so those of you who know Kathy Eric, uh, Eric, she's uh, the Geomet um, queen. Uh, she's very, very knowledgeable. And I think the first session I had with her, you know, she sat me down. It's like, Pat, if there's one thing I can say, this is a world-class all body and deposit. It is mineralogically simple, but texturally incredibly com uh, complicated. And, and, um, and so if you kind of keep that in mind, um, as geologists, you look at a piece of core, you bog down and you think, oh my gosh, what, what, what are we looking at here? But kind of taking a step back, if you adhere to the, the, the strict zonations, the zonation patterns, um, think of the um, Fe oxide uh, uh, reduction oxidation um, that, that occurs as you, t as you increase towards the um, center of the ore body. Um, so iron is a good indicator. And the second indicator is are your actual sulfides. So from the peripheries of the ore body, you're, going to, uh, you're coming from something extremely rich in sulfur, i.e. your, your, your pyrites, chocolate pyrites, and then in the, in the center of your ore body, um, you kind of have the, uh, the remnants of your, your calcite bornite, so high grade. And then along, along with that, you have your siderite, uh, fluorite, and barite alteration, which are really great proxies for, um, for your mineralization. On a grand scale, of course, when you introduce local, local faulting, um, <clears throat> this, again, just layers an, adds a, another layer of complexity. I'm on the map there, those orange holes, those are the, the, the 10 discovery holes in the late 70s and 80s. Um, and, and as you can see, they barely clipped the deposit. It was only in the last hole that they, they got a really good intercept and, and got more funding to, um, to carry out some more, uh, some more drilling. Um, just to give you a really brief kind of graphical overview of what we're dealing with, here we have our unaltered um, Roxby, Roxby Downs granite uh, with increasing uh, hematite content uh, and increasing brecciation even furthermore. And then at the end, at the, right in the core of the ore body, we have this, this hematite quartz uh, matrix, which is unmineralized, but um, very, very high in, 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 um, in hematite, up to 60%. <coughs> 
Right. Other lithologies that we, we model as well, uh, the slimes are intrusive granites, are felsic and mafic volcanics on the left-hand side there. We have various dike swarms that have in, intruded through our, our, our fault system, and then an array of different types of sand and mudstones um, right through our clasts and conglomerates on the right-hand side there. Now, the main, main point of this slide is that the more data we, we collect, the more informed decisions we can make around models. And starting in the early 80s, going from the sedimentary host to kind of alluvial fan uh, environment to the 90s, adopting a dietary MA type model, increasing our knowledge and, and ability to interpret this data right through the 2010s, which we still um, kind of adapt to these days, is this brichiated system whereby you know, our volcanics in blue there and our, our overlaid beta-clastid fasces have become part of the fractured system and, and hence kind of sunken at depth. I mean, you drive underground. Oh, but I mean, just to put things in perspective again, we have around 500 to 600K of, of underground development underground, which is, uh, I'll struggle to wrap my head around that, but it's big. Um, at 600 meters depth, you, you come around, uh, across these large cl banded classes fasces. You're like, how on earth did this get here? Um, so well, that model kind of explains that. I was very, very fortunate to head over to Olympic Dam uh, to undertake the modeling work with the mine geology and resource team. And the way we kind of thought about doing this was to actually take the, the whole LeafFrog ecosystem, um, LeafFrog Geo, Central, and, and Browser, and kind of find a way how to break up this this model into bite-sized chunks. Um, so here we have, this is you know, covering the entire resource, um, and the, the main kind of value drivers for us were, all right, we, we want to improve our geological confidence, um, improving the communications to our stakeholders, hydro, geotech, mine planning, mine development, etc., and essentially optimizing our mine plans in areas that are in, in the next, you know, in the, the two-year plan, so. Okay, so it all starts with the database. And I think we had a really good luxury in terms of saying, hey, this is what we want. How do we get there? And it was essentially taking our database, asking ourselves the questions, how do we want to do this? And then designing a database from the very foundations to serve our geological models. Um, so yeah, efficient data database would set up a path to success. Um, as I've described, we have a very comprehensive data, uh, database, um, up to 30 assay um, elements um, that we sample for, including geomet, mineralogy, um, stoichi stoichiometric uh, calculations that are all included into our models. Um, so we kind of thought, we, I mean, we gave it a crack, just modeling everything in one go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I need a very powerful laptop for that. <laughs> So the whole, the whole idea around having 14 drill rigs active at a time, um, receiving data on a daily basis, making sense of the data, interpreting data, and um, kind of converting those into meaningful volumes, um, had to be thought about very carefully. Now, what we've done, and look, yeah, one, of the, one of the images on the left-hand side there just depicts the, the data density. You know, that's a 20-meter section, sorry, 25-meter section, and this is just ongoing throughout, throughout the mine site. On the right-hand side there, we, we have our regional faults, which we've used as uh, model boundaries. Um, the black lines uh, essentially control the data extents and acquire that we use. So we've, we've given them our polygons. And we've essentially, as you can see, we've broke, broken up the model into separate puzzle pieces. Um, for each puzzle piece or each model, we then have a separate data export and import back into acquire that allows us to um, generate our data, both in the model, feed that back to acquire, and then if you have an area of overlap, because that area has been imported back to acquire, um, the model importing data will get that information. Um, so yeah, we have a we have a buffer on on these extents. Purpose for that is to incorporate data on either side, the foot wall and the hang wall of our faults, and gives the geologists a competent uh, confidence to model across these boundaries. Okay, so <clears throat> I just touched on that briefly. So we're looking at um, submodels. Um, 
in, the, in our case, we have 10 submodels. And an example there, I've, I've broken out a submodel as an example. Um, the polygon, the yellow polygon on the left is the data extents. The cross section through that um, depicts the data that is controlled by the yellow polygon. The geological volumes, however, are controlled by our lateral extents or our, our regional fault network that we have created in a structural model. Yeah, I guess we kind of thought about the size of these models and we wanted something, as I mentioned before, to, to be dynamic, to be, to have, a, to kind of uh, produce a nice user experience when you're importing data, reloading data, um, you know, reloading your intrusions, making, producing edits, you want that to be reasonably fast. And we, we kind of found the size that the, the models currently are um, works, works very well. So I'm gonna talk about three kind of model types that we have. The first one is our structural model. It's a standalone project. And essentially the models, uh, sorry, the, the, the meshes that are produced in the structural model are driven by you know, geophysics, ge geochemistry, all sorts of interpretations. These are, these are interpretations that have been carried over the, the, the last couple of years and incorporated into a fault network, um, hence being made completely dynamic. Um, these extents are then imported in, into our submodels. So if I'm working on, on, on submodel A, I will import the structures that relate to my project. Um, and as they are laterally extents and linked through central, every time we have a structural update in, which occurs in the structural model, those effects and changes and meshes will then be carried through uh, using central to our submodels. So these are just some examples here where the regional fault system have kind of um, cut out our modeling extents for a specific area. So logically, following on from our structure, we start modeling our lithology. We model within a fault block, sorry, within a model, we, create, we start creating our localized faults, those green lines or surfaces in, in, in the submodel. Conversely, once we model these surfaces in a submodel, they flow back to the structural model so that the structure all remains in the same location. Um, once again, any rerun of the model um, or any structural inter will re-trigger um, the, the lateral extents and will rerun the, the litho model. The green surfaces, which are our local in inferred faults, those are the ones that divide our submodels into our fault blocks. Um, based on our fault blocks, obviously, using leapfrog, we can add all sorts of trends um, and individual um, items into an individual fault block, which is very advantageous using the system. And yeah, it's not only lithology we, we model, it's also our RQD and alteration uh, per fault, sorry, per submodel that feed into the entire master branch, which I'll be looking at in a second. So here, a very uh, rough schematic of three types of submodels. And once we have an update or a publish, these volumes then get fed back into our master branch so that we can track the evolution of, of the master branch and the, and the geology. The reason we don't have the geology in most of these sections is that because where drilling is taking place currently, we're only focusing our efforts on those three individual models. But as our uh, rig movements kind of progress and move along, those models will get filled up. This is a quick sna snapshot of how we keep track of all our data. Um, through the well correlation tool, uh, we've, we've kind of established a, a, a very cool routine on how we flag um, not just the collars or not just sections, but entire drill holes, um, whether they're historic, whether they or not they've been interpreted, peer reviewed, um, or they have been logged. Um, this gives Geolog multiple geologists working on the same deposit, a really good idea of what data has been touched or uh, manipulated or in interpreted in general and which areas need attention. 
similar for the collar, we've introduced syntax um, that basically give the modeler a, a go, like, like, kind of like a traffic light. We know where the planned collars are, um, holes that are still awaiting assays or you know, waiting uh, validation on an interp are in a progressive state. And so holes that are green, i.e. drilled, those are the ones that the modeler then can then say, all right, I have all my data I need. I can go ahead and, and um, um, interpret that hole. Um, this is just a, a third thing that we look at is confidence, geological interpretation confidence. How confident uh, are we in a certain area? Um, if we have a low confidence, say, we know exactly where to uh, focus our efforts on, on additional peer reviews or um, additional mapping, those sorts of things. So the cool thing about this, like I said, it's not only getting data from our database into our models, but we've, um, we've established a link to acquire that whatever data we have, i.e. if it's interpretive, high, low, medium confidence, and obviously our lithology or our interpretation, we can write that back. And so as acquire spits out new data overnight, um, we have an up-to-date database uh, which allows the geologist the following day um, to pick up where he or she left, left from. Um, something we've, we've just started introducing is uh, our underground mapping, obviously. Pretty stock standard for mine geology if you're underground. Um, and it's taking all the legacy data, putting that into a database that, that is coherent uh, with, with our new uh, um, kind of mapping standards. Um, and using the structural module in, in LeapFrog, actually making sense of our structural data. Um, in addition to mapping, we've also started orientating our core. So, you know, based on, on measurements along core, we now have, a, again, a nightly export that incorporates that into our submodel exports. The third, the third aspect of this whole project is looking at the sulfide models. Again, this is also a standalone project in central, and essentially we, we use the, the, the sulfides, uh, think of it as a high grade and, and a low grade, i.e. Your, your, your boronite or a sulfide domain as a, as a source of demanding for resource. Um, because the mine is broken up into various areas, we have various branches that reflect these areas. Um, so say we have three resource geologists conducting a, a sulfide update, they can all work individually side by side and once the peer reviews have been taken um, care of and, and, and transferred to central, all the volumes can then be transported um, or imported into a master branch, meaning that all the kind of review data is in one, one location, and that's what, what gets used in the estimation process. Okay, so in summary, we have three, um, I guess three streams, we have our, our structure, where we take our, our regional structure into play, as well as the local scale, i.e. fault block. The regional structures act as, as model extents for our um, lithology, alteration, and RQD models. And within, within those models, we then split it up into our fault blocks, um, which then feed back into our actual structural model. So that's a closed circle. The lithology component um, takes those fault blocks. Um, it allows us to uh, model separately in, in, within a submodel. And once that has been peer reviewed, it goes and flows into a master branch, similar to the sulfides. And this is just a recap of the slide we just saw. Um, so merging various mine, uh, mine areas with, with adjacent data. Um, exporting or publishing this back to central, and again, into the master branch. So essentially, at the end of the day, in your master branch, we have our lithology, our RQD, alteration, and sulfides all living in one. As you can see, I've kind of hoped to demonstrate here that the, the logic that we've used is very tightly bound around LeapFrog, LeapFrog Central. Um, it's an extremely integrated process, which means if you change one thing, you, you load up new data. Obviously, you have new interpretations to, to deal with. Once you publish those, you get a notification saying, well, you have a new boundary that you, you, you should in, introduce and, and reload. 
So you do that, the model reruns, and you're kind of in an extremely dynamic um, state of modeling sulfide structure and lithology. Um, we're beginning to use Leafbrook Browser for our peer reviews, especially resource versus mine geology and our sulfides. Um, and we find it great as we can track our audits, we can track our comments, and it's all in one location. And based off the, the reload function in Central, it's really made the, the efficiency um, or the process extremely efficient at Olympic Dam because I guess we're dealing with one deposit, multiple areas, and multiple geologists. So that's all I have to say, I think. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so the end, end result is that we have one location, i.e. that master branch where we have all our resultant volumes. Um, and this is where resource then head over to get them, retrieve them for their um, estimation process. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Pat. Uh, do we have any questions for him? Hey, Patrick, thank you for the, the, the great presentation. Um, um, you said that uh, the model was built from a series of other models, historic models. Uh, I'm curious to know how you, you managed to back flag the data, the drill hole with the previous models. Because you, you, don't, you, you didn't simply rebuild the model. I guess you used the previous model, back flag the data, and restarted from that point? Right. So yeah, maybe I, I kind of um, miscommunicated that. The, Paint a picture, we had, we had 35 logging codes. How on earth are you gonna model you know, eight different types of granite? You know, it's very blobby. So um, what required it, we essentially said, hey, let's group, let's start grouping our, our individual logging codes into model, modelable, <laughs> that word even exists, um, uh, uh, formations and, and lithologies and we didn't back flag, I mean, it was the, the, the volumes that existed in, in Vulcan, for example, um, were produced very explicitly, um, but the logging um, was split up in, into those various, you know, in the, into those 30 different types. Um, so what we essentially did was where we had volumes, um, we've manually flagged those in LeapFrog and then back flagged from there. So it was only you know, two or three solid volumes that, that can say, all right, we, we're happy with those. Those are legit. Um, other than that, we've, we've, we've recoded the entire database for, the, for the, this dynamic process. Yep. Uh, one more question quickly. Thanks, Pat. Are you able to elaborate just a little bit on, are there different people doing the structural model and then there's different people doing the list model and how that interaction has gone? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, in Roxby Downs, it's a, uh, we have residential geologists, we have 5243 geologists, we have 86 geologists. And so you know, things have to keep on moving. Um, once again, we have more technical streams in relation to our production teams. Our production teams tend to take care of our day-to-day -day interpretation by the technical teams, look after the, um, the structure, a kind of you know, two to five year type thing. Um, however, so it's, it sounds ex incredibly disjointed, um, but you know, obviously, hand over day, um, uh, we have workshops that, that talk about this. And so, yeah, structure, I mean, a lot of work goes on, on, a, on a in a certain week, and then on, on the, cr the cross swing, for example, they'll they'll do they'll work on another um, set of, of work, um, but at the end of the day, um, through handover and, and you know these our weekly w workshops, um, we do tend to align and join, and I guess that's a really good point because even if there is if there are um, uh, disagreements on on certain interpretation, uh, we can easily branch off in central and and basically test different hypotheses. And which, which one ever kind of comes out top, so you just carry on with that one. Yeah, but that's, I think that we found as well, that's where the um, colla online co collaboration. So unfortunately, you know, some geos don't get the chance to meet face to face, but if they leave comments in 3D in browser, um, the, 
the, geologist, the geologist on swing um, has time to get back to him or her in regards to an interpretation that they've done. Yeah, so there's definitely cross-pollination um, of both swings based off browser and the, the annotations on the side there. Thanks a lot, Pat. Thank you.